good afternoon. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you all, and especially on this spring day. Um, the benefit of presenting this late in the year is uh, being able to have this palpable sense of what it really means to write in community, not just in the community of fellows, but in the community of Cambridge. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to thank the Associate Dean of the Fellowship Program, the inimitable uh, Judy Vishniak, and the Dean of the Institute, Liz Cohen, uh, for providing such inspiring leadership. I wanna thank uh, the Radcliffe administrators and staff who make this such a special place. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Schlesinger Library, especially Kenby Phillips, uh, for making accessible so much of the material I've been working with this year. Um, a tremendous thank you to Jordan Villegas, my Radcliffe research partner, for your incredible archival research and um, the privilege of your intellectual company. And thank you to my fellow fellows, my Africana Studies group, um, the Race and Resistance group, uh, my friends, my family, our caregivers, and uh, most of all, my very patient and generous partner, Deb Vargas. Um, so there are many stories in contemporary African-American women's literature that you probably already know. There's the one about an oppressed black woman in rural Georgia whose homoerotic relationship with a blues singer enlarges her sense of the sacred. You may remember that blues singer, Telen Seeley. I think it pisses God off when you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it. Or at least I think that made it into the Spielberg version. Um, then, of course, there's that thrilling story about the woman who kills her infant daughter to spare her from slavery, and then is haunted by that daughter returning in the flesh. And that also, in another way, thrilling story about um, how 48 black writers, in a rare moment of unanimity, took out a full page ad in the New York Times when uh, Toni Morrison's beloved was snubbed for the Pulitzer Prize in the National Book Award. There's that story about that book's author becoming the first black woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. There's the story about Oprah Winfrey's production company buying the rights to that book. And that one, and that one. Uh, throughout my work as a queer, black, feminist scholar of culture and politics, I've been interested in the stories that we don't tell about African American literature. My first book started with the minor works of major authors. W.B. Du Bois's 1928 novel, Dark Princess, a novel that one critic called a dirty old man's fantasy that should have never been published. Um, and Zora Neale Hurston's Moses Man of the Mountain, a feminist rendering of uh, the Exodus myth in black vernacular. I read texts like these as challenges to the heroic tales that we like to circulate about black leaders and black history and African-American literature itself. In, uh, excuse me, in the book I'm writing now, The Other Side of Terror, Blackness and the Culture of U.S. Empire, I wanna tell yet a different story about African-American literature. I began the project with the sense that in order to fully understand the 21st century in African-American literature, we needed a robust theory of how the literature reflects changes in the nature of racial power that were ushered in by the war on terror. The war on terror that escalated after 2001 wholly transformed discourses of race in the contemporary United States. Against the threat of a foreign enemy, public culture emphasized national unity across racial divisions, across gender divisions, divisions of religion. At the same time, increased surveillance linked the threat of Islamic terrorism to a history of domestic counterterrorism aimed at containing black radical radicalism. As scholars of race after 9-11 argue, the war on terror exported the technologies of surveillance and punishment historically aimed at black people while importing the now racialized figure of the Arab Muslim enemy. The result was a transformation in the relationship between blackness and the culture of US imperialism. 
while anti-black racism continued to link blackness to criminality, public culture also affirmed blackness as the sign of enlightenment with officials like Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell announcing the nation's fitness as a world leader in democracy. When I analyze Condoleezza Rice's memoirs, I discuss how she writes the history of late to post-Cold War US power as a coming of age story in which the histories of white supremacy and anti-racist protest are lessons in domination that the nation eventually comes to master. When she writes of being sworn in as a Secretary of State, she notes how she glances up at a portrait of Benjamin Franklin and wonders, what would he have thought of this great granddaughter of slaves and child of Jim Crow Birmingham pledging to defend the Constitution of the United States, which had infamously counted her ancestors three-fifths of a man? Conjuring the history of racial exclusion only to expiate it, she writes, somehow I wanted to believe Franklin would have liked history's turn toward justice. Turning to colonial history to defend the post-Cold War operations of security, diplomacy, and preemptive war, as well as to affirm her own role as one of the architects of contemporary security policy, Rice ties life writing, autobiography, to the imperial enterprise. If we understand empire to be more than a discrete economic or political project, a whole way of life, not only for the foreign subjects of domination, but for the US citizens who benefit from it or are subjugated to it or who resist it. One of our tasks as humanists is to ask how international relations shape domestic cultural expression and how culture enables US imperialism. Accordingly, the question I set out to answer was, how did the war on terror transform discourses of race? and in turn change African-American literature. As the project progressed, I became more and more interested in how many of the writers I was working with were writing in the black feminist grammars of countervalence, grammars that emerge from long, hard looks back at the power that's looking at you, grammars that expose the longer history of the war on terror as an imperial project that was articulated through both existing and newly invented codes of race, gender, and sexuality. Black women's writing exposes black women's intimacy with surveillance, policing, incarceration, and border security, where intimacy signifies a multi-scalar relation between military industrial and personal cultural forces. For example, I'm writing about Gloria Naylor, who rose to fame after the 1982 publication of The Women of Brewster Place. 12 years later, Naylor sat paralyzed in her study, unable to write for fear that the computer she was writing on was being hacked, or that the room she was writing in was bugged, or that the voices she was hearing weren't coming from inside her own head, but were rather being projected through um, a microwave sonic device beaming messages through her bedroom wall. Instead of writing the big novel she wanted to write, she wrote an only partially fictionalized memoir about how the NSA targeted her with a comprehensive program of surveillance and intelligence experimentation. I'm writing about Nikki Finney, whose 2011 volume of poetry, Head Off and Split, addresses, among other things, President uh, George W. Bush's Mission Accomplished, Condoleezza Rice's Mastery of the Concerto, and the abandonment of black New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. In the latter case, Finney tells the story of black vulnerability and black privilege from the perspective of the Ferragamo shoes that Rice was shopping for while New Orleans was underwater. Back and forth, we wondered what it must have been like just to float away in the gushing arms of the ultimate separation, left shoes stranded forever from right, the shoes say, or they marched straight to the back of the store, knocking us off our stands and poking their secret hands down our satiny private parts. From high in the stacks, we watched her shoeless dilly-dally bringing up the rear. Beautiful toes for a secretary of state. 
I'm also writing about um, the memoir of Shoshana Johnson, an American soldier who was captured in Iraq in 2003, and a short story about a returning Iraq war vet who suffers from PTSD, and a novel about a child of the civil rights movement who becomes a lexicographer at the Pentagon and spends his day parsing definitions of torture and a television show about a Capitol Hill fixer who fulfills a certain fantasy of black female sexuality as the scandalous beginning of a new world order. There's a version of this talk where I talk about all of these things. Um, but I thought, um, because we're here, I would focus more of the talk today on the materials I've been working on at Schlesinger. Um, if we situate contemporary writing about the post 9-11 war on terror along a continuum of black feminist writings about counterinsurgency, intelligence, and surveillance, we can get a better sense of how contemporary US empire has transformed African American literature throughout the long war on terror. I use the term long war on terror to refer to the global campaign of counterterrorism that escalated during the late Cold War period against organizations deemed domestic terrorist threats, such as the Black Panther Party or the Black Liberation Army. I map the transformations of African American literature in this context, beginning with COINTELPRO and proceeding through the war in Vietnam the Iran hostage crisis of 1979, the first Gulf War, and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. My book begins in 1968, when the phrases Afro-American literature and black aesthetic were fighting words. That was when protests and assassinations, urban rebellions, and the declaration of war against black communities with Richard Nixon's Law and Order campaign split time into an irrevocable before and after. That was when writers and critics made explicit the political defiance that suffused calls to, for example, let the world be a black poem, to make black writing and criticism responsive and responsible to the revolutionary third world movements for independence. And this is now when the phrase African American literature rests neatly unchallenged in course catalogs as a featured subcategory for online book shopping or in polite conversation considering, say, the latest bestseller about slavery. During the five decades between then and now, texts by and about black Americans surfaced in the most unlikely of places to do the weighty ideological work. <clears throat> of uh, building a domestic multicultural consensus to post-Cold War US foreign policy. Texts by black authors bore the iconoclastic standard for revolutionary change at the same time as they were marketed to consumers in the multicultural classroom or bookshop or even daytime talk show as keys for understanding the other. In other words, the development in the culture of black books at times shook but at times shored up the ideological scaffolding of late Cold War and post-Cold War US security. If multiculturalism and then post-racialism have been the racial and gendered logics undergirding the project of securing the world for democracy, you could say that black texts played an important role in making the world that was being made safe for democracy feel democratic to American readers. This contradiction is most apparent when we turn to black women's literature. At the precise moment that black women writers envision literature as an unbounded form for radical internationalism, their work was cycled into spectacles of domestic celebration and confrontation, spectacles limited in scope to both national politics and to heterosexual relations in the home space. Um, so I'll just show a, a quick, um, clip from this 1989 Donahue show. Um, and what you'll see is uh, kind of black men on one side of the room, uh, white audience on the other side of the room, black women writers on stage. Um, and what I'm interested in is how this kind of conversation plays out um, 
this kind of intra-racial conversation that becomes limited in scope to the domestic, both the national and um, the domestic in the sense of the home space. You're a victim. It's like you're trying to say you, you can't make it without uh, your mother or your father. It's like, what are they saying there? It's like, I it's like you're trying to say I that I was lucky no. because I had really my mother shameful. and father. Yeah. No, no, no. I think it is Maybe really that's shameful all. that so many of, especially the young brothers in our community, have grown up looking at women as somehow the enemy. Yeah, I know. I, I disagree and with you. I think that that, I I think that, that has you been inflicted on the community. No, we think that it's a white culture. So just to give a sense of that range of materials, um. I'm working with. Uh, so the two stories that I want to tell in the second part of this talk are part of this larger story, the one about African American literature's troubling embeddedness in public languages of comfort and safety, the same one in which black feminist writers from this position of troubling embeddedness call forth new languages and new practices and new imaginaries of safety. June Jordan will introduce her own reading of her own poem about my rights. Tonight, the poem about my rights to uh, Brenda, Brenda Rocha, who's a 15-year-old Nicaraguan girl whose left arm was blown off by the Somacistas, and it was after that that she joined the Sandinistas. And I would that we all could emulate her courage. Even tonight, and I need to take a walk and clear my head about this poem about why I can't go out without changing my clothes, my shoes, my body posture, my gender identity, my age, my status as a woman alone in the evening, alone on the streets, alone not being the point. The point being that I can't do what I want to do with my own body because I am the wrong sex, the wrong age, the wrong skin. And suppose it was not here in the city but down on the beach or far into the woods and I wanted to go there by myself thinking about God or thinking about children or thinking about the world, all of it disclosed by the stars and the silence. I could not go and I could not think and I could not stay there alone as I need to be alone because I can't do what I want to do with my own body. And who in the hell set things up like this? The writer and activist June Jordan published her most well-known work, Poem About My Rights, a poem about the endangerment of black women and black women's poetics in 1980. This story begins about a year earlier. On August 27, 1979, Jordan walked out of her home in Brooklyn into a domestic war. You could say that the story begins when Jordan took off her writer's hat and put on her activist hat. But of course, there was only one hat. So we'll just begin with the weather. It was hot, it was pouring down rain, and it was ne nevertheless necessary to be outdoors in protest. The New York Police Department had killed Luis Baez, an unarmed Puerto Rican man. And while the, while the NYPD was conducting an internal investigation, Jordan was marching in a demonstration with two artist activist friends, Gwen Hardwick and Alexis DeVoe. The trio arrived at the demonstration in front of the 79th precinct in Bed-Stuy and joined with about 1,000 protesters. The peaceful marchers were then attacked by police officers who used their squad cars as weapons. Jordan writes in her notes later that night, we halted and stood quietly in the rain waiting for directions. At this point, suddenly, cop cars came from everywhere, abruptly flashing lights and roaring sirens and drove directly into the people. We tried to hold our lines, but the cars were plowing directly into bodies. Everyone was screaming with shock and terror. Taking cover, Jordan and her friends lay flat between two fences while cops came out fast, hunting for people. It was pure terror for our lives, she wrote. The August 1979 police riot changed the direction of June Jordan's work. 
In the most immediate sense, it changed the play that Jordan had just finished drafting, a play about police violence titled The Issue. The Issue was first completed in July 1979, about six weeks before the Brooklyn protest. It was later performed as a dramatic reading at the New York Shakespeare Festival in 1981, directed by the black feminist playwright Entezaki Shange, who had by then become famous for For Color Girls. And it featured a 43-year-old Morgan Freeman reading the lead part. A revision that Jordan completed just after the riot incorporated one of one character's account of a demonstration in Brooklyn that included details from the scene of terror at the 79th precinct. She says, the officers drove the police cars full speed into the crowd. They were plowing into us straight ahead. A more significant change to the October 1979 version was the multimedia prologue that Jordan added to the play. Now the audience would hear sirens, first singing slowly, then maddeningly intensifying, holding for an ear-splitting minute and a half. Um, Jordan added to this sound work a photographic montage, a black and white silent film, as she called it. The montage shows images of police violence against black people and ends with a series of headlines that normalize and euphemize police violence against black youth. Honest mistake, cops say, or boy seven shot by holiday patrol, and so on. The sirens blare for a full minute and a half after the images fade, then the action begins. So the character's elaboration of the police raid heightens the play's realist rendering of police violence and announces the issue as an uncovering of the violence that uh, the official state language of police chiefs and newspapers hide. In contrast, the dizzying flash of photographs layered over the discordant sounds of gospel singers and squad cars achieves the opposite effect, not to reveal that which the audience doesn't know, but to force a disorienting, dissonant confrontation with what the audience knows too well black life's quotidian overexposure to the state's machinery of death. Jordan was 43 when she wrote the issue and poem about my rights. By then, she had worked across artistic and political forms. She served as a production assistant for the film The Cool World and collaborated with architect R. Buckminster Fuller on an architectural redesign of Harlem. She worked as an organizer in Mississippi with Fannie Lou Hamer, then as a freelance writer. Um, she published her first book of poems, Who Look at Me, in 1969. She taught in adjunct positions all over the Northeast and um, even at Wisconsin with Pat. Uh, from City College to Sarah Lawrence to Yale. Um, in 1978, Jordan began work as a tenured professor at SUNY Stony Brook, where she taught until um, she later left for UC Berkeley, where she founded her famous Poetry for the People. By the time she died in 2002, she had written or edited 27 books of fiction, progressive nonfiction, and poetry. You'll find in most African American literature anthologies the profoundly affecting poem about my rights. Uh, you will not find the Beirut joke book or apologies to all the people in Lebanon, written in memory of the Palestinians who were massacred at the Sabran Shatila refugee camps in 1982. Yes, I did know it was the money I earned as a poet that paid for the bombs and the plans and the tanks that they used to massacre your family. What was consistent across Jordan's work was her keen attention to the relationships between the state violence leveled at black people in the US and the US led and or US funded invasions and occupations in the Middle East, Latin America and South Africa and the way that violence was explained away by racialized discourses of safety. The way Jordan's work wrestled with the many arms of American imperialism's broad reach was to return to the elemental forms that built the language of empire and to invent insurgent grammars of survival. From offering primers on official language to cataloging the dynamic forms of speech that kept 
The militant energies of black power and third world feminism alive well after the revolutionary 60s, Jordan's genre crossing inquiry into what she calls the perfect grammar of the state offered US linguistic forms up for a radical reclaiming from empire's uses. And I wanna come back to this issue of language um, in a bit. Um, but first, to return to our Brooklyn tale. The 1979 police attack was a defining moment in Jordan's career. Domestic counterinsurgency now shaped Jordan's already politicized work. The attack also deepened Jordan's commitment to autonomy from literary institutions. Less than two weeks after the attack, she followed the prominent black queer feminist Audre Lorde in resigning from the editorial board of the white feminist journal Chrysalis. Jordan conjures the memory of that night of state terror as a catalyzing event. Quote, two weeks ago, myself and another black woman poet and another black woman artist came within 18 inches of losing our lives inside an unbridled police riot in Brooklyn, New York. Our crime to be black and breathing on the streets of the 79th precinct. Tell me slash show me how your hopelessly academic, pseudo-historical, incestuous, and profoundly optional, profoundly trifling, profoundly upper middle class, attic white publication can presume to represent our women's culture, the very tissue of our ongoing tenuous and battled experience. Writing of this exchange, the um, incredible independent scholar Alexis Gum says, if racism slept, unfortunately it doesn't, but if racism slept, it would have nightmares about June Jordan. <laughs> While she retained a skepticism about literary institutions, Jordan was, of course, one of many black feminist writers and thinkers who enlisted writerly craft to challenge threats to black women's collective well-being. And we only know their work, indeed, I'm only here as a university employee, because black feminist scholars have made a political project of bringing and keeping black women's creative work in circulation in state and marketplace institutions against the prohibitions of publishing houses, curriculum committees, and school boards. On the other hand, black women's writing bears a self-conscious relationship to the state's affirmative relationship to racial and gender and sexual difference, its invitation to black literature. Paula Marshall's 2009 memoir, for example, begins with an account of her receiving a letter from the State Department inviting her to accompany her mentor, Langston Hughes, on a cultural tour in 1965. When Marshall accepts the invitation and travels to the State Department for her briefing, she learns that the agency has been tracking her leftist activism, and she suspects that the government has invited her dissent as proof of a thriving democracy. She says, the fact that I would be openly critical of the US government's policy could well serve as proof that the country was truly a democracy committed to respecting the First Amendment rights even of its most vocal detractors. Thus, Washington might well come out the winner every time I opened my mouth. Marshall embar embarked on the tour anyhow with the intention, as she says, of making use of being used. The struggle between black feminist insurgency and state-sponsored counterinsurgency in the age of rights was, in this way, never very distant from the state's affirmative uses of black expressive culture. It was during the years that black women's literature was being made over from object of derision to object of desire that June Jordan entered the American University as a contingent laborer. Given her positionality at the margins of mainstream academic debates about literary tradition, we might read her creative output during those decades as work that is askew to what was being imagined, circulated, and taught as African American literature. These were the years that Jordan was traveling to Nicaragua as a freelance journalist, reporting on the Contras who were demolishing black Nicaragua bomb by bomb or she was organizing responses against the massacre of Palestinians in Lebanon in 1982. Even after she began her tenure job at Berkeley in 1989, she twisted the demands of her job to create auxiliary spaces of resistance to US empire. 
There she was organizing a teach-in against the Gulf War in 1991 or going to Lebanon in 1996. The turn from the domestic scenes of literary professionalization and traitorous black women airing dirty laundry toward relentless critiques of US foreign policy lent Jordan's writing over the course of her, her career a sharp edge that, um, as we shall see, was honed against Ronald Reagan's war of counterinsurgency. Poem for Nicaragua. So little I could hold the edges of your earth inside my arms. Your coffee skin, the cotton stuff, the rain makes small. Your boundaries of sea and ocean, slow or slow escape possession. Even a pig would move towards you, dignified from mud. Your inside walls, a pastel stucco for indelible graffiti. Movimiento del Pueblo Unido. A handkerchief conceals the curling of your outlaw lips. A pistol calms the trembling of your fingers. I imagine you among the mountains eating early rice. I remember you among the birds that do not swallow blood. The years between 1979 and 1984 challenged Jordan's stubborn idealism. There was the murder of 28 black youths in Atlanta. There was Great Britain's bloody defeat of Argentina in the Malvinas War. There was uh, the massacre of hundreds of thousands of Salvadorans by US-backed and US-trained forces. There was the callous refusal of refugee status for Haitian asylum seekers. There was the US-supported and US-funded genocide of more than 100,000 Mayan peasants in Guatemala. There was the massacre of Palestinian refugees. There was the policy of constructive engagement with apartheid South Africa. There was the invasion of Grenada. And of course, there was that fateful night of crawling to safety in Brooklyn's summer rain. If domestic counterinsurgency shaped Jordan's work in the early 80s in work like The Issue or Poem About My Rights, the left feminism of her poetry of that time shielded, or we could say censored, it from the consumerist gaze of the neoliberal literary marketplace. During these years, Jordan's internationalist vocabulary of justice faced off against the Reagan administration's campaign to rid the earth of the threat of communism and to recover from Vietnam. In June 1983, Jordan traveled to Nicaragua as a field correspondent for Miss Magazine and Essence Magazine and The Village Voice. This was in the aftermath of the Sandinista Revolution. Uh, when US-funded counterinsurgents called Contras were actively staging a brutal assault on Nicaraguan civil society. Jordan went, as a poet and journalist, on call, as she referred to her mission, to track a hemispheric regime of counterinsurgency and intelligence. American involvement in Central America in the early 1980s revitalized an intelligence industry that was in decline after the formal end of COINTELPRO, the FBI's covert program of intelligence, aimed primarily at stemming black radicalism. What distinguished Nicaragua as a, tar as a target in the United States' vicious campaign for hegemony that used Latin America as a laboratory for repression was the discursive scaffolding that the US government erected and the terms, terms like low intensity conflict, freedom fighters, self-defense, that made the violent assaults on Nicaraguan civil society palatable to a US public. The Contras weren't the first anti-communist counterinsurgency sponsored by the United States. Similar policies have been attempted in Guatemala and Cuba, but as one Latin American historian points out, no other counterinsurgency was championed for such a sustained period of time in such idealistic terms. These idealistic terms might be unintelligible if not for the black woman's function as what theorist Hortense Spillers calls a national treasury of rhetorical wealth. 
In his 1985 State of the Union address, for example, then-President Ronald Reagan made the fight for self-defense in Nicaragua legible through three women of color. The redemptive figure of the female Vietnam refugee pictured here, the salvific figure of the elder black matron pictured here, and the deviant figure of the poor black mother left to our imaginations. First, speaking of the Contras, Reagan urged Congress to support funding the freedom fighters and continue all facets of our assistance to Central America. I want to work with you, he said, to support the democratic forces whose struggle is tied to our own security. Reagan then turned to Jean Nguyen, a Vietnam Vietnamese refugee who is now studying at West Point becoming an American hero, and redeeming the failed mission in Vietnam. Finally, bringing the speech to a close, Reagan turned to Clara Hale, a black woman who founded Harlem's Hale House to care for children in need, especially children addicted to drugs. Reagan went so far as to invite us to Mother Hale's window to watch her cradle the children who, we might presume, have been abandoned by the welfare queens hardly worthy of the assistance that might otherwise find its way to the Central American death squads. Go to her house some night, and maybe you'll see her silhouette against the window as she walks the floor, talking softly, soothing a child in her arms, Mother Hale of Harlem, and she, too, is an American hero. Reagan offers this image of soothing care and soft whispering to sanitize the dirty war he's asking Congress to authorize. This places the black female, not mother, not mothering, in a vestibular relation to proper citizenship, to use Spillers' term. We must pass through this marked woman to get to our freedom and safety. What the Vietnamese student and the black not mother tell us, said Reagan, is that anything is possible in America and that history is asking us once again to be a force for good in the world. The discursive scaffolding of the Reagan doctrine called upon racialized gender difference to signify redemption and to personify the kind of assistance that the US was offering to Central America by way of torture manuals, artillery guns, and mercenaries. Jordan's analyses of official state language relentlessly exposed the racial gender logics that undergirded state manipulated terms such as freedom, security, America, and hero. She went to Nicaragua as an outspoken critic of North American foreign policy, which she placed in quotations, seeking what she called a purification of terms. She wanted to see this threat to national security up close. The suite of poems that follow Jordan's 1983 trip to Nicaragua, collected in 1985's Living Room, are a study in the new grammatical forms that she called for in response to the massacres along the Reagan frontier. Living Room offers a series of six poems for Nicaragua. In each of these poems, Jordan toggles or suspends subjects and predicates, nouns and verbs, so that Nicaragua and its people exert their force upon imperial grammars, taking over the grammar that made sense of US intervention. In Poem for Nicaragua, for example, the first three stanzas offer descriptions of a you addressed in the poem, conceivably the country itself, by offering subject compliments. That's um, a kind of a grammar term to um, describe your this or your that. Um, subject complements detached from the second person subject, the you, or the transitive verb to be. So instead of, um, instead of you are so little, I could hold the edges of your earth, et cetera, it's, it's just so little. I could hold the edges of, of your earth inside my arms. Your coffee skin, the cotton stuff, the rain makes small. Your boundaries of sea and ocean slow. The subject of the poem casts a hold over the speaker who could or would hold the subject, some you, somewhere, inside the speaker's arms. This hold that the withheld, withholding subject, escaping possession, has on the speaker surfaces in the truncated verses, the lines without subjects or transitive verbs. The poem offers an impression of a subject's slow escape, possession, 
rather than a realistic account of a subject's appearance. Indeed, the most material, actually concrete image in this poem composed of surreal figures is an image of a wayward marking that overwhelms the boundaries of civil speech and complete sentences. Your walls, a pastel stucco for indelible graffiti, movimiento del pueblo unido. Poem for Nicaragua is addressed to a subject who eludes capture in language, whose withholding hold possesses the speaker. The subject is not a figure who appears in or along the dictates of a linear space-time continuum that is implied by conjugations of the transitive verb to be. Rather, the subject of the poem is imminent, is among a landscape to which the speaker of the poem can only gesture when she, at last, in the final two stanzas, shows up in the first person. I imagine you among the mountains eating early rice. I remember you among the birds that do not swallow blood. The Nicaragua poems thus arrange language to withhold the subject of its lines. This withholding challenges the um, grounds upon which Nicaragua would otherwise come to be known through projects of affirmative incorporation or counterinsurgent repression. Um, the poems that follow Poem for Nicaragua in Living Room heighten Jordan's indictment of North American innocence and her attention to what could be called guerrilla forms of care amidst devastation. In first poem from Nicaragua Libre, Teo Te Casinte, Jordan reproduces formal elements of Poem for Nicaragua, the withheld or deferred subject, for example. The poem refers to Teote Casinte, a Nicaraguan village near the border of Honduras, where Sandinistas fought against counterinsurgents in mid-June 1983 when Jordan was there. The New York Times reported that the Contras attacked Teote Casinte for eight days before retreating back to Honduras. It reported property damages of over $15 million and noted that 11 tobacco warehouses were burned along with, oh, 11 homes. The Times re represented the invasion of Teote Casinte as a symmetrical battle between the counter-revolutionary station in Honduras and the Nicaraguan rebels, normalizing and distancing violence as an unfortunate, unpreventable, and intrinsic part of third world existence. Jordan's poem zooms in on the space that is in photographic terms represented aer aerially in the article. The first stanza offers two questions. Can you say Teo Te Casinte? Can you say it, Teo Te Casinte? These questions offer a lesson to English speakers, an invitation to North American readers to consider the cost of US-backed war. But whereas the poem first offers the village up as the object that might be spoken by a US subject, the second iteration of the question makes Teote Casinte the you, the subject of the address. Can you say it, Teote Casinte? This revision of the poem's guiding question in the first stanza reveals its interest in both making the suffering of Nicaraguans visible and questioning the terms of that visibility. The speaker addresses then eclipses an English speaking you. The second stanza accomplished this revelation occlusion by representing the human victim of an artillery attack through a kaleidoscopic gaze. Into the dirt she fell, she blew up the shell. Fell into the dirt, the artillery shell blew up the girl. The arrangement of verses here mimics the scene of explosion it's describing. Jordan reverses the rhyme of fell and shell in the, two, the first two lines, placing uh, those words at the beginning of the following two lines. So uh, the repetition and rearrangement of the word phrases fell, shell, into the dirt, blew up, approximate words landing on the page. The poem, like the earth under the girl's feet, is scattered in pieces. Jordan also toggles the subject verb placement throughout these lines to shatter the language with which she writes of the unspeakable destruction in Teote Casinte. The subject follows the preposition of into the dirt she fell, and then in the following line, she becomes the active subject who goes so far as to explode what is exploding her. She blew up the shell before shell blew up the girl. Um, 
The use of rhyme throughout the poem mimics children's literature and songs, which use iambic pentameter and simple rhyme schemes to teach language. So um, if you just want to hold the verse, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water in your mind for a moment, um, that's the kind of uh, nursery rhyme I'm thinking of. Um, first poem from Nicaragua Libre is a primer on counterinsurgency. It is teaching an audience how to address literally how to enunciate Teotecacinte, a town destroyed by US-sponsored terror. But the use of inter internal rhyme, rhyme within the lines, destabilizes this very lesson. It's not as simple as it appears, the words aren't where they should be, and neither is the girl who the words are describing. Repeating a question as if teaching a child how to speak, the poem references the young girl's lost vitality and innocence. As importantly, it denies the audience the very innocence of liberal regard. This is a description of death that holds off the liberal consumption of victimhood from a comfortable distance. Instead of asking, can you see it? The poem asks, can you say it? Um, inviting a reader to iterate her own intimacy with US state violence only to, again and again, destabilize the very you to whom the question is posed. In these ways and more, the Nicaragua poems code messages of insurgent survival in a historical moment where the most powerful weaponry of the West was aimed at what Jordan called the true first world peoples. If it was imperative in 1979 or 1983 to locate or invent the grammatical forms that would interdict the imperial grammars that, for example, invited you to get cozy with a black woman's book to become a better American, or for example, called upon an aging black not mother not mothering to smile in assent to Contra War, it is, of course, even more imperative now when even the dubious neoliberal consensus has shattered, when we offer prisons as answers to social problems, when Guantanamo stands, when we occupy Wampanoag territory as we speak, when activists are still called terrorists, when immigration ban, when border wall, when pipeline, when ice raids, drones, checkpoints, so I offer these stories not in the interest of making us better American consumers of black women's stories, but instead in the interest of clearing space for the unmarketable and yet irresistible stories of decolonization and utopian world building to exert their force on us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>